Hey everybody, and welcome back to this week's episode of Flick News. Isola here with Flick Direct, and if you're new here, I use this time to give you a little bit of the information uh, that we've gotten on movie news, and sometimes I will sprinkle in some TV, video games, you know, whatever fits in with what we're talking about. So grab your popcorn, sit back, relax, and let's get this started. So, I don't know about you, but I have been watching Saturday Night Live since I was a wee lass. Some cast members and years, major hits, others, eh, kind of missed. But my favorites came from the original in the 70s, and I used to watch the reruns with my mom on Nick at Night, maybe? I, I don't know. There was some place where we could watch the reruns, and you know, sometimes you would have Belushi dressed up as a bumblebee, um, or the land shark, Candygram. One of my favorites. So when I heard that a movie was being made about Saturday Night Live, I got very intrigued, very excited, because I kind of wanted to see more about how it all started and learn a little bit more about the original cast, which, yes, there are a lot of documentaries and people have come out and done, uh, you know, interviews talking about drugs and alcohol and body dysmorphia. I can't really say the word on YouTube. They don't like it. Uh, we don't want to get this taken down. The newest info we received on the SNL movie is that it's actually going to be released slowly versus just coming out into all theaters, which is actually a good play on the part of the studios. These limited showings will be in New York, LA, and Toronto, and they start September 27th. And then Sony will release it October 11th for the rest of us. Sony is likely doing this to get more buzz and positive reviews uh, before it's released to the rest of the public. Kind of like test screenings, um, this is just an after test screening. And again, like I said, this is probably a good idea because it's just getting more people wanting to see it uh, because they do have to wait until October unless if you are in the cities that I had mentioned. Now, this is a very impressive cast, uh, to say the least. And if you know anything about the original SNL, there was one cast member in particular, Andy Kaufman. And if you don't know much about Andy Kaufman and his demeanor and attitude, I highly recommend watching uh, Man in the Moon. Jim Carrey stars in that one. There's also a documentary called Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond. And again, if you see this, it will really give you an idea of how difficult this role is. Nicholas Braun will be playing Andy Kaufman, and of course, because of everything I said, he probably had his hands full. Not only that, he's also apparently playing Jim Henson, which I have to go back to the trailer to see that, because I did not notice that when I first watched it. The test screenings are saying he really pulled it off, so this makes me really excited, because again, these are really tough characters to play. They're really not characters. I mean, they're real people. But again, when you're trying to portray a real human being, there are a lot of things that go into that because you have to make sure you're doing the mannerisms and you kind of sound like them. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing. Now, you also have some amazing talent like Willem Dafoe, uh, who is playing NBC exec David Tibet. Rachel Sennett is playing Rosie Schuster. J.K. Simmons is playing Milton Berle, which that's, that's a great fit. Ella Hunt as Gilda Radner. Matthew Reese as George Carlin. Gabriel LaBelle as Lorne Michaels. And Corey Michael Smith as Chevy Chase. So like I said, this is a very big cast um, with, again, a lot of shoes to fill. But I think that uh, based on the test screenings, they did pretty well. I am really curious to see how this movie is going to do and who's going to see it. You're obviously going to have the you know audience from the 70s and for nostalgic purposes are going to see this and also to see some of the behind the scenes 
of what did take place during that time. But I think you're also going to have a newer audience who, you know, are just going to enjoy because they like SNL in general, or they're just curious to see how it all began. So let me know your thoughts. Are you going to go see it? Are you excited for it? Or is this just not something that's on your radar? Again, I'm going to see it and I will let you know what I think about it. Okay. You knew that this was coming because you know I'm a big fan, but Beetlejuice Beetlejuice was released and it is knocking everything out of the park. And I'm so excited about this because I was a little concerned in the beginning, but a lot of time has passed. So usually when you wait this long to make a sequel, they tend to work out. The sequel raked in an impressive 110 million and opened in almost 4,600 theaters on its opening weekend. This makes it the second biggest release in September, just under It that came out in 2017. You remember It, the movie. I love that one too. And that one was pretty impressive when it came out in September as well. It brought in 123 million, which makes it a very close race to number one. It also stands as the third highest grossing debut, just behind Deadpool and Wolverine and Inside Out 2. And we've discussed those as well. We knew those were going to be some pretty tough shoes to fill in regards to beating them as uh, an opening weekend debut. Internationally, Beetlejuice brought in about 35 and a half million. Um, so that brings it to roughly 145 million opening weekend, which is phenomenal. Especially since it cost about 100 million to make, which, you know, again is great. They have at least exceeded what they spent, unlike Kevin Costner, who is actually still trying to say he's going to do chapter three of Horizon when chapter two hasn't even come out yet. They've delayed having it come out and it may not even come into the theater. I don't know if he's stubborn, whatever. But again, I still haven't watched chapter one. I'm, I'm just very nervous to watch it. And there's far too many things that I'd rather watch than that at this point in time. But maybe when I'm video editing, I will uh, put it on in the background. I think Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice is doing really well because you have that nostalgia for the OG audience. And then it mixes in newer, more offbeat humor so that you can get in the newer audience. Obviously, this is directed by Tim Burton and stars Michael Keaton, Winona Ryder, Catherine O'Hara. And those are pretty much the OG cast. Uh, and I'm really glad that they got at least those three back. But there are some others in there, and I'm sure you've watched the trailer, so you already know who they are. Just a quick synopsis. Um, this takes place 36 years later, and Lydia returns because of her father's passing. And in this, we actually get to meet Lydia's daughter, who is played by Jenna Ortega. And unfortunately... She does not listen to her mother and accidentally reopens the portal to the afterlife, which is a big no-no because we definitely don't need that in our lives. But I mean, where would the movie go if we didn't have it? Of course, you know, I'm going to be watching this uh, once I'm done with this and editing. I am actually going to hit the movies because I just am so excited for this and I'm really happy to hear that it's doing well in the box office. So let me know what you think if you go and see it. I will definitely give you my thoughts after it's been seen, but I would really love to uh, read your comments. Finally, we have more of a breakdown on the movie The Wild Robot and how it builds on the book that was written by Peter Brown. The movie follows Roz, a robot voiced by Lupita Nyong'o, who is stranded on an island and comes across many different types of animals. Some of those including a very protective mama possum who is played by Catherine O'Hara. You then have this cute little playful fox who is played by Pedro Pascal. 
and an orphan goose played by Kit Connor. So the story basically follows Roz, again, stranded on this island, but finds an orphan goose. So you're watching Roz pretty much raise this goose, and then you get some twists and turns along the way. Look, the verdict is still out on AI. Some think of it as the coming of the end of days, like Terminator 2. And then others see it as this fantastical way of having a companion or something to help you that's useful in everyday life. I think you can safely say that depending on when you grew up, you'll know what bucket one fits into. For me personally, I have mixed feelings about it. I can see the pros and cons, but the cons tend to feel like they're a little more heavier weighted. But there's another time and place where we can discuss that, not here. The director, Chris Sanders, examines the dual nature of technology, uh, showing how much machines can be cold and unfeeling, but also shows tenderness and care. Now, this is not your typical animated movie where, like in Toy Story, there's constant dialogue and, you know, vast amounts of humor. With this one, there's actually more like half of the dialogue that you would normally have. And Sanders really did that intentionally because he wants you to focus more on the visuals and the emotions that come with that. And I think that's a very smart way of doing this movie. The Wild Robot will be released in theater September 27th and is for all ages or PG rated ages. I'm really looking forward to this movie. I think it'll be nice to see a different perspective on uh, AI. And I'm also really excited to read the book, but that will be done after I watch the movie. And with that, this concludes this week's episode of Flick News. Please be sure to like and subscribe to all of our channels so you never miss out on any entertainment news. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!